Thanks for tuning in today. I'm John Holmes, and today we are going to unassemble and reassemble the Ender 3 printer. So I was lucky enough to win an Ender 3 printer from Electroboom, one of my favorite channels on YouTube. I highly suggest if you are into electronics and people shocking themselves, you check out Medi's channel, Electroboom on YouTube. So I won this. I really don't ever win things, but I won it from his channel. And I really don't need another 3D printer. Let me count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six printers, I think, right now. And this would make seven. I did sell a few. Uh, eight printers. Got a, I can't forget about the one that I have in my van all the time that's, you know, always ready to go. At any rate, I didn't need one. However, this is probably the most popular printer on the market right now, the Ender 3 from Creality or the Ender 3 Pro, which is a slightly upgraded version. This is the normal version though. This is a $200 3D printer with a big, big enough build area. I believe it's, uh, what was it, 250 by 250 or 200 by 200. It really doesn't matter. It's big enough for most people. It also has a lot of really cool features to it. It's got this uh, basically like a almost magnetic bed where you take it off and you can flex the bed to get your parts off. Super rad, super rad that a $200 printer is coming with that. But usually with low cost printers comes some compromises. And my one main concern, always my one main concern with low cost printers, let's just be real, these are cheap, is the motion control board. And I have seen over and over and over again, bad solder joints cause a printer to fail. It either loses steps or the heater bed stops working or you know, pretty much a host of anything on this board can go wrong. So the first thing that I wanted to do was to take a look at exactly how good their solder joints were, how everything was put together, and if there was any considerations for you know, thermal issues that may occur. So, Taking it off, this came from underneath the printer, uh, nice and tucked in. Taking it off, this is essentially how things lay out. We have our stepper motors plugged in up here. These are actually hot glued in. Probably the worst choice for glue on a board that has heat, but it'll probably be fine. And then we have a lot of our sensors located on the other side. You know, uh, thermal sensors, we would have uh, probably the heat for our, let's see, we can actually look on the back and see. Uh, right, so our big ones come in here, our 12 volt. This is gonna be our heater bed control. Uh, this is gonna be positive and negative 12 volts probably for the fans up there. Our hot end are these two other red, let's see, where's the bed? Okay, the bed is the two big red wires. The hot end are the two small red wires, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we can go on and on. But what my main concern was, was our solder joints, and mainly the pins on the back side here. And to tell you the truth, for a low-cost printer, they all look pretty good. I don't really see any bad solder joints. I don't see any solder joints where the pins themselves were corroded prior. I have seen that to where it's, you know, a bad silver job or whatever, or the tin itself was uh, not exactly the purest tin. And so it uh, ended up corroding and not doing its job connecting to the solder. But there are just a few pins that I do have concerns about. Namely, this guy right here, and this guy right here, and probably that guy right there too. However, they have a pretty good solder flow around the majority of the pin. It's only on this back side that I am seeing a little bit of problem. So I don't know whether I should do a little bit of resolder work on there or just leave them as is. It looks like it's good enough, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm just gonna uh, flip, a, flip a coin. Let's see, I got a coin on me somewhere. Yeah, perfect. This side up, I'll resolder them. We are not resoldering today. All I'm gonna do is basically put this board back. It should be good enough. And to do that, we just have these little screws. And the kit comes with everything you need, all the tools that you need, and et cetera, et cetera. It is really an all-inclusive kit. So would you have resoldered these pins, or would you have taken it a chance on a coin flip? Anybody else out there have an Ender 3? Have you had any problems with failures? Or has it been an extremely solid machine for you? If you don't have a 3D printer, do you have a friend with a 3D printer that you use for all your, your printing needs? 
or do you use printing houses? What is your favorite thing that you've ever 3D printed? And there we go. We have our board bolted back in. The next thing we need to do is put our handy dandy little Creality labeled brushless fan, 24 volt, 0.1 amp. And I'm pretty sure this is actually driven by 12 volts. So uh, I guess it's a, just a little bit slower speed. More than likely they did that to make it last an extremely long time. It looks like this fan is pressing down on the wires. Should be fine. There's enough housing around the fan. And speaking of fans, how many fans have you had fail on your 3D printers? All of my old ones, specifically the Monoprice Selects, I have had pretty much all of the fans fail. However, they have a lot of time on them. Uh, I think one of them I've printed about seven kilometers of filament on. The other one doesn't have the readout, but I would estimate maybe three kilometers of uh, filament before it started to have fan problems. And again, you know, those were $300, $330 printers, pretty low cost. You can't expect them to last forever. Yeah, that looks about how it was. Wow. Uh, a little pro tip, don't move your printer back and forth too fast because it will boot up your printer. And if you move it so fast that you push more voltage than the board is capable of handling, you will burn out your stepper board. So whatever the maximum speed of the printer, let's say 100 millimeters a second on 12 volts, if you push it at 200 millimeters a second, you are effectively pushing 24 volts back into your printer. And unless it is designed, specifically designed to handle that over voltage, you will fry the circuitry. I have never done that myself, but you can watch your screen turn on when you push the sled back and forth. And that has caused people to burn out their printer boards. My kids saw that one time. They're like, hey, daddy, the screen turns on when I move the bed back and forth. Whoa, you know, and they're like, hey, da, 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 da. yeah, yeah, don't do that. Just a word of advice, nice and slow, nice and slow. So like I said, it comes with all the bolts needed, all the tools, all of the Allen wrenches, not to be confused with his cousin, Terry. And Terry was pretty mad that they didn't name the Allen wrench after him. Cause it was Terry's idea to begin with. I mean, I don't know if you know this story, but all right. So we're almost back to where it was. This is typical me taking it apart. I probably voided the warranty and one more and we will be back. Do you like to void warranties? Do you even use the instruction manuals? I know I don't. Unless absolutely needed. Sometimes they're handy. I have pre-assembled a slight amount of this printer. Super easy to show you what I have done so far. This screen bolts on right there with the two bolts. It tells you right here in the instruction manual. These two standoffs bolt into the frame with the two bolts located right there and there, and there and there. It's in the instruction manual. The power supply bolts into this standoff here and here, as shown in the instruction manual. And what is super cool about this guy is that it has your on-off switch built into there as well as your 120 volt receptacle. I'm betting we're gonna have a part in here that says Z limit switch. Hey, look at there, Z axis limit switch right on the package. It's very nice of them to do that. Our limit switch has to plug into our board to tell us when to stop. Without this limit switch, guaranteed it's gonna crash. This is considered home, and if you don't have that installed and plugged in, it'll just keep going and keep going, and then and I'll try to kill the machine. If you've ever had one of your plugs fail, or your switch fail, or a solder joint fail, you have experienced this. Let me know if you have experienced this before. Essentially, we are going to put our Z-axis motor on and then install our lead screws. This is the Z-axis stepper motor, and it does say right there, Z. And now we put on the Z axis. And just a gentle reminder, this would be a perfect time to put in some Loctite because I guarantee this is gonna be loose after a few thousand hours. I would recommend only one Ugga Dugga on this. One Ugga Dugga. There we go. So we loosen this back up. We get it nice and straight looking. 
and then tighten it back down. Just one ugga And if you're not familiar with the ugga it is the official measurement of torque without using a torque wrench. Hey, there we go. Nice and straight. Now we are finishing step five, which is the crossbar that goes up and down our assembly and also houses the extrusion motor. And the last part of step five is threading this little guy into this little guy. And I would highly suggest only a half ugga dugga for this one. Per the manual, it goes together like this. Step seven. Well, we have just installed the belt tension wheel for the top carriage, as you can kind of see over here. Now we are on to step eight, which is installing the belt for probably this part. Now that we have the belt on the extruder, what we need to do is tighten up this little idler wheel so that we can get the belt tension nice and tight. And we also want to make sure that the belt is in line with the extrusion so that the belt is not riding on one side or the other and rubbing. Now we are on to step nine. This is when we thread the Z onto the Z axis. There we go. That doesn't look too bad. Hey, and it rolls nice and smooth now. I think we're good. So before I go any further, this guy is loose. This is our extruder, or at least the head of our extruder. The actual extruder motor, the stepper for the extruder is over here, but this is where the hot end is and all the action happens. Maybe you can see that on video, but it's pretty loose. This would attribute to a lot of inaccuracies, especially in small prints. So before we go any further, I am going to tighten this up. There we go. Now we're making progress. Still rolls free and there is no play. Sweet. I think we got it. Also with step nine, it calls for tensioning the nut on the Z carriage that this threaded rod goes into. Now we are done with step nine. We have installed our Z axis. We have the belt tension properly on this guy and it is moving back and forth smoothly. And we also tighten the nut that keeps this assembly tight on the extrusion. So now to step 10, the top. Now we have finished step 10, installing the upper extrusion with the two M5, I'm sorry, the four M5 by 25 millimeter screws. On to step 11. That's neat. Instead of just being a regular old like thread on nut, it's a quarter twist. Now we have done step 11, which is installing this holder for any filament that we may or may not want to use on this 3D printer. And lastly, we are on step 12, which is pretty much wiring up the entire thing. This one labeled E is E for extruder. After we plug our E in, all that's left is X. And what is the X going to do? The X is going to give it to you. Next, we plug in to our screen. So we have plugged in our power. We have plugged in our limit switches. We have plugged in everything. All right, so we have it built. That took right about one hour of my time. If you've built one of these, let me know how long it took you. So it comes with a little SD card and usually they have a sample print already on them. The G code already made for you from whatever STL file they have at the factory. So what do you think they put on here as a sample print? So it's a boot time to boot it up. Do you think it's gonna explode? We have power, success. Let's do our first test. We want to prepare. Uh-huh, looking good. Super slow on the Z-axis, but uh, we may be able to change that. Success! I think it is ready for bed leveling and doing the sample print. Prepare menu, disable steppers, and now I can move them around. 
Now we start bed leveling with these big Oreos that they included. And essentially what we want to do is have the bed level with the nozzle at all four corners of the bed. Some people use a sheet of paper underneath it or a dollar bill. I typically just do it by eye. There we go. And like I said, I'm just doing this visually. I'm getting it as close as I can. Oh yeah. And a lot of times when you have four of them, you end up chasing it around. How much time do you spend bed leveling? Is it a set it and forget it sort of thing or you try to do it every single time you print? I typically do it once every six months. Once it's leveled, it's leveled. And if I have a different filament that likes a different amount of squish, I just change that in my software instead of changing my bed so that it is always good to go with the same bed leveling every single time. We are about good to go. There we are. Looking good. I think that's about good enough for leveling. So we want to print. Whenever you want to print, the first thing you need to make sure is that your bed is clean and not just clean, but clean, clean, clean. So I would highly recommend that you get some isopropyl alcohol of 90% or higher strength and you use that to wipe down your bed. So now we are at the final stretch. And this is the decision that you will have to make on what sort of bed you will print on. Do you print on blue tape? Do you print on the plastic surface that comes with printers these days? Do you print on Kapton? Or do you prefer glass? Now, I am using denatured alcohol right now to clean the bed. I really don't recommend it because it'll probably take some of the bed with it. We're gonna find out. Yeah, it didn't really take any of the bed with it. A lot of times denatured alcohol will break down that plastic and it will cause some softening. So I am living on the edge trying this out. All right, so we are ready to start the print. Do, 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 prepare, preheat. Where's my preheat? Preheat PLA, there we go. So we have gone into our prepare menu and told it to preheat for PLA. They so nicely provided what I would assume is PLA and I would assume that the print that is included with this is for the PLA that they give. That is a lot of assumptions coming from a Chinese factory. I will tell you this much. We are going to hope that this is PLA. It smells like PLA. Print from card. Ooh, what is this? We have a pig. We have a dog. We have a cat. So we got, we got a choice of a pig, a dog, and a cat this time. I am impressed. Let's try the pig 4H. Woohoo! I'm interested here. Now we feed our filament in and I will give you a little trick. This fancy MRE that they came with is actually a set of side cutters, flush cutters. And if you give an angled, you know, about a 45 degree cut, to your filament, it will feed in through your Bowden tube a lot easier. There we are. We're going back to pig. Pig G code. So now we are just waiting for it to warm up. We have primed our nozzle. We have the filament pushed all the way in. And it did have a little bit of brown filament that was already in there. So we'll see how long it takes for it to squeeze that out and transition to the white that they also included. But we can see it's heating up. We got 45 degrees on the bed. It is currently at 48 and it is trying to get to 200 degrees on the nozzle. It is currently at 124 and climbing. All right, we are pretty much just waiting for this printer to get going, but our time is up today. What we will do next time is see how that pig printed Oh, it's going to start, but yep, we ran out of time. Oh, let me get that out of the way. So I will see you next time. We'll see how this pig turns out. Thanks for tuning in.